Thanks to your generous donations to our Kickstarter funding campaign, Clive Barker Podcast presents Fundraiser 4. Welcome back to the Clyde Barker Podcast. We got another audio commentary for you guys today, and this one is from Masters of Horror, Series 2, Episode 8, Valerie on the Stairs. So we are paused right at the opening for the show. Um, You can see on mine, I can see Stars Productions and like two drops of blood right above it uh, Mm -hmm. on this sort of white, uh, white cloth, like a bed linen or something. Yeah, the opening credit for the show. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. So uh, by the count of three, uh, you guys can start playing it and sync to our commentary track. So are you guys ready? So right. one, two, three, play. There we go. I just got go. the third drop. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This opening always reminds me a little bit of uh, American Psycho, the movie, because yeah. there's also an opening with, like, blood dripping on, on a white surface. Yeah, or um, Dexter had that, too. Weird. Oh, yeah. I used to like Dexter. I, I saw, like, uh, two or three seasons of it. So Masters of Horror. Yeah. There we go. I like the credit. Uh, yeah. Like I said in, in the other one, Heckle's Tale, I think this was a great, great show. It had some really awesome episodes. Some were a little, you know, less interesting than others, but, God, there was one, I think it was Carpenter's episode that had, like, a demon baby that was so messed up. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I had read that they wanted to make this uh, creep show, TV show, but they couldn't because of some kind of rights issues. Mm, okay. Um, so this one has Tony Todd. He plays the Beast. Right, uh, right. Yeah, and actually if you go to episode eight, uh, when I was at Mad Monster Party, I, I asked him about that, and uh, he was he was pretty uh, candid about it. He said... Uh, he said that they sprayed on his costume, and he said, you know, he, he said there's nothing like getting your balls sprayed at 8 o'clock. Oh! Uh, you know, th- this uh, makeup reminds me of, if you have that edition, the Stealth Press edition of the Books of Blood, there is a, a, a new uh, prologue or, or introduction that Clive Arker wrote, and uh, here we have a rejection slip for this guy, Rob, uh, the, the writer. But Clyde Barker had this story about uh, going out with David Armstrong during, I think, Halloween or something. And how uh, David Armstrong dressed up as a black-looking demon uh, with a giant dildo in front of him. Yeah, and then two water balloons thing. dripping from it. And then, uh, I think they censor that. And then eventually they release the... The introduction, the complete introduction on Revelations where you could read it. But uh, I thought that was fun. Yeah. And there's a picture of it, too. Oh, wow. Some special effects by Greg Nicotero. And uh, was it Rick Baker? Yeah. Yeah, and you, you can't fault the uh, effects. Yeah. So Rob Hannesy, that's the name of our writer. He's getting rejection slips, and I guess he's getting a little bit of uh, writer's block. And, yeah, and there's something in here, you know, they're just showing us, like, this montage of, it's not just rejection slips, but also that, you know, he's he's in debt, and he needs probably needs to get out of his apartment, and the Heiberger house conveniently um, accepts struggling writers, which we'll yeah. find out in the narrative here, but... it's I think this was kind of a thing, like, uh, around Europe in some places, because... Some rich people, some philanthropists or something, they would set up this place where uh, artists, struggling artists could go and uh, have a, a quiet environment where they could work until they were published, and then they were kind of on their own. There's a Hellraiser comic from Marvel from the 90s that has this story called Blood of a Poet. Yes, It's right, very, right, very similar yeah. to this one. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Where this that writer was... goes into this house, and then there's some people there, some writers and artists, and one of them is creating a, bo- uh, a machine that can break uh, the gate between this dimension and the Cenobites. Right, yeah, that's right. 
And it said it on the cre- opening credits based on a story by Clive Barker. And I think that uh, uh, there's a lot of, you know, I think that, that because of that, uh, people assume that this is an adaptation uh, of, a, of an actual short story, but it's not. Uh, he wrote uh, he wrote the um, treatment. treatment for this, and then Mick Garris developed it into the into the movie episode that it is. That's right. Thirty nine reject slips for <laughs> Terry's latest novel. Wow, that's yeah. a lot. Uh, uh, Revelations has the treatments as a PDF that you can go there and see. It's Clivebarker.info slash Valerie on the stairs. Yeah. I think, and there's yeah, and it's, it's in several parts. Yeah, separated into like five five different files. Uh, actually, the URL is ValerieTV.html. Oh, well, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that Clive's complete treatment was pretty uh, detailed. It was pretty detailed. I think if Mick Garris added anything to it, I don't think he added a lot. So. Mm. I like this one. Do you write gruesome stuff, horror stories? And he's like, yeah. no, I just want to touch people's hearts. Yeah. <laughs> and and th- that it's funny because this um, – uh, preparing for this, watching this, uh, I, I started thinking, man, this character is really badly cast. He's so phony. And then and then later on I was like, oh, yeah, never mind. <laughs> 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 yeah, there, there's uh, a reason for that. It's it's kind of the genius of this uh, of this movie. Which, it's not perfect, but there's some really neat, neat things that they did with this one. And I, I like it better than uh, Heichel's Tale and the way that was adapted. I like it better, too, because I like the story. I like the fact that he's a writer. I like, you know, books, and I, I love that, that kind of stuff. I always thought the Heichel's Tale seemed a little derivative. Mm-hmm. And it, it's only like – it's only um, – it's only like uh, – claim to like the supernatural is like the fact that there's like sex with zombies and you know i'm not a big zombie fan to be honest so for me that always falls a little by the wayside but this one was cool this one has a lot of imagination to it and mick garris uh, said it was the first time he had received a 45 page treatment for a 60 minute teleplay <laughs> yeah you might as well have written the script yep yep so, uh, Ryan, do you know if this story uh, was originally written just for Masters of Horror, or was this ever published anywhere else? I have, I don't, I don't think it was ever published anywhere else. Um, and right. It might have been. He might have done it just for this because he's got a pretty good working relationship with Mick Garris. Um, mm-hmm. I, or it could have been something that had been just filed away, and the, you know, somebody grabbed it and said, "Hey, you know, how about this?" Yeah, I don't know. But I don't think it's I don't think it's ever been uh, that it's ever been um, published or published or released in any in way. book form, at least, yeah. because it was released, of course, in Revelations. But uh, yeah. So but Clive that, Barker said Valerie on the Stairs is about a house which has been given by a now dead writer, a failed writer over as a kind of hospice for failed writers. They take rooms and they can stay there. And the moment they get a piece of work published, they're out. <laughs> so. So if the if the work is. If the if that person is dead, like who's managing this building? I guess they would have we're, left yeah, sort of a foundation or like a yeah. I mean, yeah. They must have been they, yeah. They would have to be really rich to to keep maintaining this place for in perpetuity. I guess, but right. So a failed writer. I guess he got not as failed <laughs> later yeah. because he ended up buying a house and left uh, left behind some sort of uh, you know inheritance that would keep this in business. Yeah. Maybe so uh, nine rooms. Or yeah, there's nine rooms in here, and there's a, a big house. Nine fervent and fevered and desperate imaginations working each in solitude can do strange things to houses. But this we is only a good really Clive Barker. we only really hear about like three other people, right? I, I don't think, think so, there's yeah. nine writers in this in this uh, movie. I don't think so either. I, yeah. We don't see that and, many people. And, and I guess. In fact, the, the, the three writers that are here are all sort of critical to the plot. Mm-hmm. Very, very critical. Um, so there's also Christopher Lloyd is in this one as well. Yeah, yeah, which is cool. And he was in uh, also in Quicksilver Highway, which was also done by Mick Garris, so probably not a, not a huge coincidence. I guess they just, you know, uh, directors and producers and actors, you know, sometimes they have their favorite – Actors that they cast, and when they have the project, they can probably just get in touch with them and say, hey, are you interested in this? And they say yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, and it's like Christopher Lloyd, you know, playing a quirky character. That makes sense. Yeah. So uh, uh, Rob Hannessy, the writer, our protagonist, is played here by Tyron Lazo. And I don't think I've ever seen him in anything else. Yeah. I mean, if I have, I don't remember. He was in House of the Dead in 2003, uh, oh. Assault on Wall Street 2013, and Being Erica in 2009. So he's Canadian. Oh, okay. And House of the Dead is one of those terrible uh, Uwe Boll um, uh, video game adaptation movies. Right. It was a video game, right? I think I remember seeing yeah. it on arcades. Uh, yeah. You had a gun and you could just shoot zombies and stuff yeah. like that. I think I played that a few times. Did you play that? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a Sega game, so I'm I'm a big fan. Sega. But uh, not of the movie. The movie was terrible. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's kind of like Resident Evil, right? It was also a computer game, and then they started making that series of movies with Mila Jovovich. <clears throat> and I think they're still doing it. There's another yeah. one that just came out. Right, I think they were hoping that it would become like Resident Evil, but, you know, it's based on a... a a gun game, so, you know, so it's not going to have oh. the same kind of plot. Did you just see the woman in the mirror? Yeah, yeah, uh, Valerie. This this story goes right into, like, the weird stuff, right? I mean, it, yeah. he got in there, someone kind of, like, knocks on his door, and then he goes out, there's nobody there, and now he sees the lady in the mirror. He hasn't even taken stuff out of his suitcase yet, and all no. of a sudden he, he's getting bombarded with all of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a pretty good suite. I mean, uh, for someone to live in, that's a pretty nice looking yeah. small apartment. Yeah, yeah. It, it is. At least he has more than one room uh, in the whole like suite thing. Yeah, maybe that's... he should have moved in there a long time ago. Oh, we got the predator angle. Yeah, you're right. Anytime. And then he goes to the stairs and he sees this green frog there singing. <laughs> Halfway down the stairs. You're right. <laughs> little Robin. Is the stair where I sit. Yeah. I always love that little guy, Robin. Yeah. From its nephew? Yeah. Is that what he is? Yeah. Why are those... Those little guys are always nephews of, like, the main characters, like right. uh, Huey, Louie, and Dewey. And Yeah. Well, and I think at the time, they didn't want to... They didn't want to imply that characters could be parents or you know would have yeah. sex or have children or anything except for goofy right because goofy has his kid yeah but i think that came a lot later yeah and you're trying to wondering oh my god what's goofy like in bed <laughs> <laughs> yeah did he have a wife oh gosh or <laughs> her yeah <laughs> anyway so finally someone is peeking in i think but yeah uh, uh nicola lipman plays nancy bloom I think. Um, yeah. Is that the lady that runs the house? Right. I forgot. No, uh, oh, wait. Maybe. I, I can't remember. And then there's the, the lady that's the southern wo woman who's always in her nightgown. Mm-hmm. In her slippers. So there, there's there been, uh, I, I guess, I guess we're going into spoilers. Uh, if someone's watching this with the audio commentary track, I'm going to guess you guys have already seen this. And, yeah. And you know, now you're yeah. just watching it again. We so, don't want to walk um, on eggshells about it. I mean, right. So, what I was going to say is that there's been other stories, other big examples of uh, characters in stories who are self aware that they are in a story. Mm -hmm. um, so, that's uh, uh, this one is not really self aware. It's not yet. Uh, well, Valerie and the and the demon are right. They were mm -hmm. the beast. Next, that's but, right. Uh, but we learn later that he is a fictional character, and he doesn't know it, which is really interesting. Which yeah. also is, you know, what my initial complaint that he's kind of a phony, you know, too perfect, you know, good looking, and he just wants to touch people's hearts. It's like, give me a break. But the reason is that he's a fictional character inside of a fictional movie. So it's kind of two levels of, of uh, inception, I guess. We got a nice uh, introduction to all the characters here in the stairway. Yeah. And there's there's uh, Christopher Lloyd. Yeah. Uh, famous Professor Emmett Brown in uh, Back to the Future. <laughs> Did you ever call – if there, there was listeners out there who may not know this, but uh, Ryan, you used to have like a YouTube series with a, a bunch of puppets. One of them was a crab called Emmett. Right. 
<laughs> yeah. I, I have to ask, what, did you call him Emmett because of Professor Emmett Brown, or do you just like the name? Uh, no, it was because um, in the grocery store they had IMIT crab meat for imitation crab meat. Oh, I so see. So I said it was only meat that was – this was when I was a kid. It was only meat from crab, crabs named Emmett. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. That's that's a cool uh, kid thing to, to do. Yep. And I had a, a little rubber finger puppet and that I named him, and I named him Emmett the Crab. And kind of went on from there, and it became my BBS handle, you know, pre-internet. Sure, yeah, bulletin board services. Yeah. I remember those. Yeah. Welcome to the Heiberger House. So I can't believe that this guy here, like, invites him over to his apartment. This, so th there's a few little niggling things that kind of bug me. And he's, like, really welcoming and happy and wants to invite him over to his apartment. But it's like, you know, he goes completely nuts when he looks at his book. So mm -hmm. it's like, if you don't want him to see that, hide it or don't invite him over. Right, right. That That doesn't make any sense, right? Yeah. There's one other thing that happens later on in the movie that will, when we get to it, that bugged me. You know, it's just seemed kind of stupid. But so that guy, uh, Bruce, that's mm -hmm. his name, Bruce yeah. Sweetland. He likes to wear Hawaiian shirts. Um, <laughs> yeah. He's played by Jonathan Watton. Watton. I don't know how to pronounce this, but uh, yeah, he was uh, known for Maps to the Stars, Breach, and Murdoch Mysteries. I don't know any of those things. Me neither. Uh, that's... So he's smoking too, apparently. Yeah. He had an ashtray with a cigarette in it. They always do. That's what they do to actors who don't want to actually smoke on the screen. Actually, did you know that they have special cigarettes that look like normal cigarettes, but they're just like herbal cigarettes? Oh, and they don't so... do anything? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's kind of shocking. Well, and actually, when you think about it now... What does this have to do with? What does this have to do with the story, the blood in the bathtub, and all that? I don't really remember, to be honest. I, I guess I uh, fell asleep watching this, and uh, I didn't really prepare that much. But uh, yeah, I guess we'll find out. I think later on, um, what is his name? Brett, the the writer. I forget. Mm -hmm. Bruce. He, Bruce. That's it. Bruce. Yeah, you know, we, we find out that that uh, Bruce had brought women over and and somehow they'd been like sacrificed to the beast but oh okay maybe that and has this was a uh, with it and is in a room that belonged to another writer called terry i think i'm assuming that he either oh. passed away did, did they say what happened to terry uh, oh, i don't think somebody so somebody committed suicide right 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 yeah but uh i i like that line that bruce said uh in response to rob rob <laughs> asked is this place haunted? And it's like, only by the specter of failure. <laughs> yeah. it's, that's not very optimistic for a writer. So at that point, though, the Br Bruce doesn't really know that his fictional characters have come to life, right? Even I though think some like, of them kind of suspect. Even though they're, like, super apparent to this guy. I mean, like, he sees her constantly, and they're pounding on the yeah. walls before he even unpacks his suitcase. Mm -hmm. But... Mm -hmm. For I mean, for Rob, but it, it seems like for Bruce and the other two, um, maybe they're sort of, they've got a suspicion about something, but they don't really believe it. Yeah, here's our first uh, appearance of, not first appearance, but the first time that she actually talks. Yeah. And she's, um, she's an interesting character because she's sort of a, she's sort of a cliche damsel in distress, but at the same time underneath. She's devious and and uh, absolutely, and, yeah. yeah. She's dangerous. Yeah. It, what do you think of this because, quote? Culture uses art to dream the death of beautiful women. That they put well, at the beginning of it. I think you said it when you uh, mentioned the damsel in distress, because that's kind of a trope in fiction that that goes on for as long as there's been stories. I mean, you know, told by men. Men always want to be the hero that saves the women, right? So the yeah. woman has to be in danger. For him to be the hero. So I guess that's, I'm assuming that's what they're mentioning there. Yeah. And, and Bruce has all of these, so we know now after having seen this before, he has all these photos of girls on, up on the wall. 
And uh, later on, we find out that uh, that he would invite all these prostitutes and transients and stuff over, and they would do stuff, and he would tell he would somehow get them involved in his story. I forget what, and then they would be gone in the morning, and he didn't know what happened to them. Mm-hmm. But I'm guessing he took pictures of them. Maybe. Yeah, that's why he has those pictures. He's uh, yeah. talking about those babies on the wall. Yeah, that uh, he saves his creative juice for writing. He's he's a monk. <laughs> yeah, which is something we've heard from Clive Barker directly in in, in interviews before. Sure, sure thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's mentioned that. Is that a pot plant in the back? Kind of looks like it. I can't oh, tell. Maybe. Huh. It's pretty bold. Yeah, and he's got his so he's got his book right there on the typewriter on the desk behind him, and he keeps sort of glancing at it like, "Don't look at my book, don't uh, whatever you do, don't look at it." And then yeah. he's gonna walk away and turn his back on Rob. Uh huh. There's a, I think there's like a fictional one of those fictional. Uh, one of those books where a character discovers that he's fictional. One of them is from actually L. Ron Hubbard. Mm. It's called Typewriter in the Sky. Um, a protagonist finds himself inside the story of his friend's book. That's that's kind of weird. And it, it's kind of uh, Philip K. Dick too, where people not you know people don't know that they're that they're not real or they're not human or that the reality around them is not you know yeah, the, or br- the true reality. Or like Breakfast of Champions by Kurt Vonnegut. Um, that's another one. Oh, here we go. So he's dreaming now, I guess. Oh, so that was the first visit with Bruce. I guess there's a second one where that stuff happens. Yeah. Well, of course, another one that's super like relevant to this is uh, uh, Mr. Be Gone, mm-hmm. where the, the character, the demon, is inside a book, and he's yeah. telling people to burn the book. Right, right, yeah. But in his case, he wasn't a fictional character. He was a real demon that got trapped in a book. So Bruce must have been more than uh, more than just suspicious because this guy has the exact same first and last name of his character. Mm-hmm. So he must have known, you know, when he invited him over, maybe he just wanted to, he thought it was cool, he wanted to have a conversation with his character that he wrote. That's kind of something like, uh, like what Clive Barker does sometimes. He... he these characters come to him more than he creates them. Yeah. And uh, sometimes he would really surprise him. Like, for example, Mr. Be Gone was written that way. It was just a voice in his head that he just had to write it down. So here's Rob. Yeah. Just fell asleep at his desk. Some... And, he, yeah. and, and somebody wrote, all a, wrote some more story on his computer and it wasn't him. Mm-hmm. Or he doesn't remember. So, uh, yeah. So Rob Rob is going to discover a story penned by Bruce, uh, Patricia, and Neely that's called Valerie on the Stairs. But I think it's just jumping a little bit to further. Yeah. But like you said, he becomes hostile for discovering this and kicks him out of the apartment. Yeah. <laughs> Again, it's like, if you don't want him to see that, then don't invite them in. Yeah. Uh Uh-oh, his computer had problems. He lost his file. Oh, no, there it is. But he lost the stuff he had written. What was that loading screen? That was weird. What program? Hey, you know, (laughs) TV always has weird uh, internet, uh, not internet, but... uh, That's hilarious that his... (laughs) Yeah, right? Like, because that's usually what they use in cartoons to show someone sleeping is just a little balloon saying zzz. Yeah. Yeah. And his memory of her is is uh, is so kind of vague and and uh, grainy. Yeah, yeah, which is perfect for a fictional character that it, there's no real substance to his memory of this woman. Mm-hmm. I wonder how many writers have found themselves in this spot. I think Hemingway called the uh, writer's block the white bull. Because when you have a, like a, a white page and you can't write anything, oh yeah, and you have to tame it somehow, so he called it the white bull. This seems like a sweet, sweet thing, though. I mean, if you're willing to just live in that house and mm-hmm. be comfortable with the idea of not being published, you could just stay there as long as you want it. Yeah. You know, 
I guess they had to prove that they were trying to write something. Is that the Southern lady? Yeah. I think she's played by Suki Kaiser. I think she's Patricia. Patricia Dunbar. The it's only funny the way he, he talks about his book is he's, it sounds like he's trying to sell it to her. Yeah. And he sounds kind of phony and stupid. I mean, she picks up on it right away. This guy looks familiar to me. He kind of reminds me of the character who played Ashbury. Yeah, yeah, he does. Doesn't he a little bit? What was yeah. his name? Malcolm McLaurin? Yeah, Malcolm Smith. Malcolm Smith. Thank you. And here's, you know, good old Christopher Lloyd. Yeah, he added a lot to this. Um, he added a lot to this movie. Mm-hmm. Do we call Him it a movie Tony or Harlock. a TV show? I guess if it's an hour long and it's... An anthology series. I don't know if you call these a movie or a TV show. Yeah, teleplay. Yeah. TV film episode. Take your pick. Yeah. And so, let's see. Christopher Lloyd plays Everett Neely. That's Yeah. So this was originally released in uh, December 29, 2006. So it's been... It's been uh, over 10 years now since then, this aired. And a year later on the DVD, there was a, a there was a special or like a, a making of thing called Spine Tingler, the making of Valerie on the Stairs. But I, I wanted to see this, but there's no place to find it except on the DVD, and you and I don't have it on DVD, so we weren't able to, to see it. Right, that. for the longest time, like 10 years ago, I was still living in Portugal, and I the DVD, I... Like you said uh, before we started this, that there was uh, a, a first releases of this was like an anthology DVDs, I think. Yeah. More than one episode, I guess. And, oh, there we go. Gratuitous nudity. Yeah. I wonder how this actress felt about this part. You have to play a stereotypical woman who's naked all the time. And... Yeah, it's not a particularly uh, challenging role, I guess. Yeah. Valerie was played by Claire Grant. She uh, appeared first on film opposite Joaquin Phoenix in the uh, Academy-winning film Walk the Line. Oh. So I saw that one. That's about uh, uh, Johnny Cash. Right. I remember that movie, but I don't. She uh, apparently had a theater degree in Memphis, Tennessee, where she grew up. Yeah. That's cool. She was also in Black Snake Moan. And the TV show Castle. I think that's still going on. Oh, and she was also uh, cast in Robot Chicken for a few episodes. Oh, so she must be friends with Seth Green. Uh Uh-huh. And she was also in Mega Shark vs. Colossus 2015. (laughs) I want to watch this movie. That sounds amazing. That sounds awesome. And she plays Titania in Avengers Assemble TV series. Oh, I didn't even know animated about this TV show. Yeah, it must be animated. I remember Titania. She was this really strong woman with like this spiky uniform. Hmm. Yeah, like an Amazon. I remember her from the comic books. I don't know if that's the same. This is being really, really seductive here. She's trying to recruit him to be her hero. Yeah. Yeah, but for what? I mean, I don't understand. It seems like part of this is her trying to play out the role that she that she's written into, but another part of it is wanting to just kill everybody that made her a fictional character and uh, and free herself. So well, which, they, which one is she doing right now? I think a mixture of both. I think she's yeah. trying to get revenge for being created so vulnerable and being subjected to to being the slave of a monster, right? Yeah. Well, and, and we find out that, she, that really he's her slave. Mm-hmm. I love this shot. Oh, there we are. Up at the top Another of the reveal. stairs. Another reveal of the beast. 
you know, Tony Todd is just such a suave guy. I mean, he's he mm-hmm. he can play any any like role, especially like villain roles. He he does a great job. Yeah. I wonder if he's got extensions on his fingers to make them look bigger. Yeah, yeah, maybe With the so. claws and stuff. And like, here comes the neighbors again. Because you're yelling at yeah. the wall. Yeah. <clears throat> Makes him sound like a crazy, uh, crazy guy. And the lady that manages the house is always smoking. Yeah. In some ways, all these characters are kind of tropes themselves. They're yeah. they're very kind of uh, um, stereotypical in their way. Yeah, <laughs> it's a crawl space. Right? Yeah, the southern lady who's always in her nightgown and, and is drunk, seemingly drunk uh-huh. all the time. Yeah, wears little negligees and stuff. Yeah. At this point in the commentary, Jose's laptop froze and his call dropped. And uh, I didn't know for quite a while. I kept trying to keep on talking. Uh, we edited all of that out. And what, what we're going to do is get your um, – I'm sorry to make you do this because normally these are pretty um, – normally these are a little uh, a little smoother. But if you could get yourself back to on the on the running time 29 minutes and 56 seconds – uh, get yourself to 29 f- minutes and 56 seconds, and then Jose will be joining us back again. So, hey, hi, we, we're back, 29.56. Sorry, my call dropped. So, uh, uh, all right, I'm going to start. Play. Okay, so uh, she says sorry about, about that. Dead rats in the walls. <laughs> she says, the gutter is full of young men just one step away from where you are now. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, like you said, we only really see like these three guys, which which are the guys who are going to be writing the story yeah. that kind of drives this uh, episode. But there's three floors in this apartment building, and so it makes sense that there would probably be nine apartments in here. Mm-hmm. But it seemed like he, you know, he had been waiting for an opening to come to 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 come, and then this person had to die for him to be able to get in there. So where are the other writers? I guess maybe to save money, they maybe they just wanted to only focus on these three. Yeah, the cast. They wanted to keep the production uh, at a minimum, I guess. So yeah. In the original treatment, it was supposed to be nine nine rooms. So, yeah, I mean, it would have been I think it would have been better to at least have some people in the periphery or, you know, making comments so they don't have to be like main characters. Yeah. Well, at the same time, it's like these these are failed writers and I guess it would be a little busy to have like a house full of them, you know, yeah. just con- like you said, just concentrate on the ones that are the main characters of the story. Yeah. And now this is where we start to get the idea that there's something fishy going on here that these yeah. guys are into it. Yeah. Yeah, and this this Bruce character is weird because he's describing stuff right out of his book, and he just treats him like he's an idiot, you know, or it's like, oh yeah, that, that's the Twilight Zone or whatever. And uh-huh. It's like he he you know, he's obviously just being deceptive and a jerk because he knows all about the you know the, these characters. He knows that Rob yeah. Hennessy is a <laughs> f- fictional character. Mm-hmm. And uh, wow, that's that's draft fifteen and draft sixteen. Yeah, that's that's nuts, right? I mean, Clyde Barker only does like what three hand written drafts, and then it goes to um, typed. Yeah. And then and then the editor comes in and and gives some notes and stuff. Yeah. And I that's pretty much his process. Valerie and on the stairs. And it's that weird. All this pretense of politeness is going to go away here in just a second. As soon as he gets caught, like you know, sneaking into this book, which in, mm-hmm. in real life this is not. You don't, you know, you don't try to murder somebody with a typewriter for looking at a book. It's yeah. I, I don't. I mean, you would think he would have just said pushed him away or just said, "Hey, you can't look at that." That's you know, right? He, he goes, and immediately he goes postal on this guy. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, it's like he smashes his own typewriter and tries to murder him with it right here. 
<laughs> I know. That's nuts. And then, Did he just smash the typewriter? Yeah. Okay, because I heard that on you. I'm I'm a little further ahead of you. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Let me know when Christopher Lloyd is asking him, uh, talking to him in the hallway. Oh, yeah, yeah, he is. And he's, okay. he's, he's just about to say that's not the way a, a writer acts. Or, <laughs> which this is, is an little, asylum. Yeah. And, he's, yeah, and he's like, I'm getting out of here. Oh, you see some more people behind them there in the hallway. Oh, yeah, there's two more people, finally. Yeah, extras. I never noticed them before. I never even know they were there. Mm-hmm. I wonder if the lady of the house uh, that manages the house is in is in on this as well. Yeah, I was wondering that too when we were disconnected there for a minute. I, I if, if she somehow knows about this because she's she sort of looks at them, or she's almost I don't know. She's al- almost seems like she's in on it. So here, Rob Hannessy is supposed to be like, "Oh, I'm moving out in the morning," but he's like, "No, I've got to get some writing done." Right, yeah. I mean, he's just yelling at them, saying, I'm getting the fuck out of here. And and, yeah. and I thought he was going to go to his room and pack things up, but instead he's just uh, he's just writing. Yeah, he's like, uh, yep, back to, you know, back to the old grind or whatever. <laughs> like, okay. Also, I noticed that when – oh, here he comes. It's Valerie. Yeah. Um, I noticed that when uh, Bruce pulls Rob away from the book uh, while he had it in his hand, he just throws it up in the air and all the pages get mixed up. yeah. Yeah, and his book is supposed to be precious, and he's like, oh, I hope you didn't get blood on it. So now he's all surprised that she's alive, even though Rob Hannessy's been telling him that for the, you know, for the, the whole, his whole time in this house. Well, and Rob is there as well. I mean, yeah, Rob has right. manifested himself, so that shouldn't come as a surprise to these guys. Yeah, yeah. When he says, oh, you're here, you're real, it's like, yeah, yeah, so's Rob, you yeah. know. I think it would have been nice to have a little bit more, uh, maybe a secret meeting between the three of them or something that just kind of says, like, how much they knew and didn't know. This is pretty gruesome. It is. And she told him to kill him, and then he says, "I, you know, it's all for you. And she's like, no, it was your hunger, not mine. It's kind of like, well, Fatality. Yeah, I know. It's kind of like, no. Nope, Sub-zero wins. That, he's, she's like, oh, no, that's all you. And uh-huh. uh, even though she just told him to kill him. Oh, that he totally has extensions on his fingers there. Yeah. You can totally see. Yeah. It's great. It's great makeup. That's so amazing. Yeah. And and there's these spirals on the beast. And I wonder how much uh, those spiral designs on his face and shoulders had to do with, like, Peliquin and Boone oh, from Nightbreed. Yeah. yeah, totally. Othakai. Yeah. I want to wash you with my tongue. It's totally a, a <laughs> Sexy Clive Barker. Dude. Yeah. Totally a Clive yeah. Barker line. Yeah. Yeah. That something that you could uh, read on Tonight Again, the yeah. erotic stories yeah. the book. Yeah. And that about, you know, not wanting to waste a drop of semen. And this, that's totally Clive Barker, too. Yep. Yep. Hey, they got her. They gave her clothes this time. Yeah. She's got a dress on. This is definitely this this uh, archetype of like the monster and the and the the woman like death and the maiden. You know, yeah, like, Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast, that's for sure. Oh, you can tell there that uh, Beauty has had a couple of uh, root canals on those teeth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. She's got some fillings you could see in that in that oh. picture. Uh, I know that's too much detail. This is heavy. Why do you keep saying it's heavy? Is yeah. there like a problem with gravity? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you ever watch Taxi, the the TV show with Christopher Lloyd? And uh, I I think I've heard of it. And I may Andy have seen Kaufman. a little bit of it, but I don't think I had it in Portugal when I was oh, living yeah. there. But he, um, he, he had a great yeah. character on on that show. That was before uh, before Back to the Future and stuff. Lloyd, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think the first time I, I saw Christopher Lloyd in something was Back to the Future. And after that, it might have been uh, Uncle Fester and the Adams Family. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I guess those were the two first things that I saw Christopher Lloyd in. It's funny. It's like 
he, he he works out immediately that this was a movie based on a novel that he wrote. It's like, well, why is he hanging the poster up in his room then? So he's he's going to get caught, you know, having published a, a book. <laughs> Neil Everest. Yeah. It's kind of like his version of Rawhead Rex, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but uh, maybe this guy created the monster that on the book that they were writing together. So that that that's what I got from the scene. You know, actually, that is a really good point about Rawhead Rex because he's got a, a movie poster for a terrible movie based on a monster that on a story that he wrote that he's proud of. Yeah, yeah. And then he says something like, "I guess someone had to watch that horrible movie." Yeah, yeah. That is. Uh, wow, I never put that together before. That, but that you know, there's probably some some. That's probably a real, or, you know, real uh, experience that he's drawing from making this treatment. And this line that he says, just don't tell Bloom that I'm a published author. Or she'll throw me on my ass. And it's yeah. like, well, you have a poster of that there, and it has your <laughs> name on it. Saying, yeah. So that's kind of hiding in plain sight, I guess. Yeah. So this is interesting because it's like, if he's supposed to be like the main hero of the story, how could mm -hmm. Neil Everett not know that he's a fictional character or that Valerie's real or, you know, he, I mean, he, he genuinely re, right here seems to be saying, no, look, that's just a book that we wrote. Those care those are not real characters. That is a little confusing. I agree. Yeah. But, um, it seems, yeah, we, we don't ever really get a good idea of how much people know and how much they don't, except for Valerie and the beast. They're the only ones that know what's going on. He is getting really mad at this. Yeah. I guess he's kind of scared. He doesn't want to believe that this is true. Because yeah. if it's true, then his monster will become real. Yeah. You know, if Valerie exists, then his monster will also exist, the beast. Yeah. And I guess he doesn't want that to be true because he's afraid. Yeah. But it's, it's actually the second time Tony Todd is... Uh, playing a character that's basically something comes into existence out of the out of someone's dream. I mean, yeah. obviously in Candyman they ended up doing something different. It's a ghost of a dead slave. But originally, The Forbidden was supposed to be Candyman was a myth that became real because so many people believed in it. And there, and that was I think that was true in the first movie too. Mm -hmm. He just yeah. he's like I'm going to get this book. Golly, I mean, that's that's quite a gruesome death scene. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and hey, I like there's, the there's there's one of, there's those two writers again, those two other people. Yeah, yeah. Oh wait, uh, there's, there's that, three of them, four. Interesting that those bedrooms have like little windows that lead to the hallway. Yeah, yeah, they're offices. Those aren't. And that's that, Patricia. Yeah. That's because it's an that's, office building. It's not a it's not a, an apartment complex. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, so that would be a place where they people would be writing and copy, and yeah. and people would go in and out. Or, I, I wonder mean, if we could find out the location of this uh, yeah, that'd house. Be, that'd be interesting. Or if it was all just a set, but it looks like at some point it looks like there was an actual house here. It's in. Well, was Heiberger House? Did this? Did the, did the treatment take place in Germany? Uh, not sure. I think the Heiberger was just the name of the guy who uh, okay. created that kind of foundation. Because Heichel's tale took place in Germany in the short story, but then was sort of like colonial American in the in the movie. Right, right. <clears throat> well, I'm looking at the treatment right now. So I think this is supposed to be in America. Yeah. Oh, okay. And it says here, a room has just been freed up in the Heiberger house because one of its tenants sold his first book. Where is she? That's when Rob goes to meet Nancy Bloom. Oh, okay. So she didn't, that, that writer didn't kill themselves. No. Huh. <coughs> so. There's a lot more dialogue in here that uh, I think didn't make it into the. The movie. So there is some change. There are some changes done to the Clive Barker's treatment, 45 page treatment. Maybe to make it fit into an hour? Mm hmm. Probably. Oh, here we go. 
Yeah. She's getting revenge for all these writers who created her to be such a subservient character to yeah. the Beast. I get the feeling that uh, she may have... Yeah, I was the one that made you beautiful. So, so uh, Everest, Neely... Uh, Neely Everest, I guess that was his name. Yeah. Christopher Lloyd's character created the Beast. Uh, Patricia Dunbar created, made her beautiful. And, and probably Bruce made uh, Rob Hannity, right? Could be, yeah. But how, how could sounds... these other? But how could these other people not know about Rob Hannity? Huh. I mean, he's he's like the hero of the story. How could he have hidden it from them all this time? That is an excellent question. That's one of the things where the story kind of breaks down a little bit. Maybe the treatment is better. I'll have yeah. to read the treatment. Yeah, I've never I've I've downloaded it and I've had it, but I've never never read it. Oh, she poured all her rage into that book, and I guess that's yeah. why that's why she's such a, a, a two faced character, Valerie. Yeah, and this is this is kind of really unfair. It's like for fictional characters to be getting revenge against the people who wrote them. It's like, they, you know, they they didn't know that they were make, that that they were creating real people and making problems for them. Yeah, this is a house that kind of had a, so many people imagining things and creating things and dreaming things up. That I, I love this idea that uh, having all this imagination. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Having all this imagination uh, would eventually create, create something real. Something real, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's very very Clive Barker ish. Mm -hmm. Sure, like in the Forbidden. Yeah. Now, if I if if my throat and chest were like ripped open, I don't think I'd be launching myself at somebody. Yeah, that's just another jump scare. You know, yeah. you, you got to put this in for because it's TV, so you got to yeah. have a little bit of a jump scare and a scary story. Give me the gun. <laughs> Give me the gun. <laughs> he almost shoots himself in the foot. Yeah. Yeah, the Beast. Otaki. That sounds Japanese. Isn't there a word called otaki or otaku in Japanese? Yeah. It means like weird and perverted. Oh, okay. He, he pronounces it otakai. Oh, okay. I see it. So at this point, I think Rob has figured out that Valerie is a manipulative character mm -hmm. and that she's not really, like, in danger. It seems that way, but at the same time, he, he still wants to go rescue her anyway. I, so that, that's a little confusing, too. This is, this is a cool part, that uh, behind Everett's wall, mm -hmm. that would be the, the passage to uh, yeah. the Beast's torture chamber. Torture stuff was sweet land. That was Bruce, I guess. Yeah. It was an addiction. So they just made this book go on forever, and it never. Ended. I always wondered how writers uh, share authorship of a story. I, I can understand how two writers can make a book, but three writers. Yeah. You know, one writer could just make an outline; the other one could fill it up. Yeah. But with three writers, I guess, uh, you pick up the story where the other left off and you I, go with it. Yeah. I have no idea. But that kind of messes up the intentions of one of the one of the authors is going to get the intention of the story kind of messed up if another one takes the story in a different direction. Like, have you read Good Omens by uh, Neil Pratchett and Neil – or Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman? Yeah, I love that book. I it's do It's really too. funny. But I, but mm -hmm. I always wondered reading that, like, how did they decide who's writing what or how did – I don't know. I guess in the back in the back cover, it, it explains that uh, that uh, uh, Terry Pratchett liked to write during the day, and Neil Gaiman wrote during the night. 
Oh. And then and then in the few hours that they were together every day, they would write some more stuff. You know, mm-hmm. they would decide where the story was going to go. Wow. But it's great, that book. I love it. It's got the yeah. four writers of the apocalypse, and there's a, a, a uh, held hound that comes to meet the Antichrist, but he gets the wrong address. <laughs> it's been so long, I don't remember. I, 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 yeah. I read that a long time ago. That's a great one. Are you into the Discworld books? No, I haven't read those. Okay. Me neither because there's so many and I just – whenever I I get interested in like a, a franchise of, of stories like that, it's it's hard to pick it up because you know it's going to be an investment. You're going to have yeah. to read like, like six or seven books or whatever. I keep thinking he's going to shoot himself in the head doing that. Yeah, tapping, tapping himself in the forehead it's, yeah. with a gun. It's, it's, it's a nerve. Not rate. something you want to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they kind of all, you know, fell in love with the Valerie. And it kind of seems like he, when he says, oh, you want to be the hero, it seems like he just kind of figured out that Rob is a main char- is the hero of the story. You know, that he's not a real person, that he's not. There you go. Now I never saw Bruce's final pages. Maybe he wrote you. Did you think of that? Yeah. So, yeah, maybe this Rob character is a latecomer into the story. Mm-hmm. This is kind of like a Blade Runner fake memory thing. It's like, yeah. no, I, I, I existed before I came here, and I'll exist after I leave this house. I've got these vague memories with no sound of my girlfriend, you know. Implants. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's blood dripping in there. Mm-hmm. That's where all the other men have died, I guess. Or the, all the women that, that Bruce brought back. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. I feel like there should be a boiler room and a little girl skipping rope. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So did Ozakai <laughs> hang that woman there? I guess he must have. Yeah, yeah. Ozakai, the beast. You can totally tell it's a fake rubber mannequin, oh, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, unfortunately. So this this death coming up, I hate. I think this is might be one of the, the, the worst, the worst, uh, the worst part of the whole movie. So I'm looking at this interesting fandom wiki uh, that talks about villains, and there's a page for Othikai. It says the beast was essentially the typical demon who lorded over Valerie and carried women off to their deaths. At some point, the beast became real alongside Valerie and decided to kill their creators. Oh, and this is supposed to be his, like, fake his, wife? Yeah, his ex-girlfriend or whatever that he... Yeah. Why Why is this happening? This is, <laughs> well, this is so it, dumb. You gotta get rid of... Christopher Lloyd's character so he can like be the hero by himself I guess yeah so he can have the gun yeah <clears throat> but you, you know her first thought should be like hey these are people that can maybe get me down and get me to a hospital not like yeah I'm gonna take a big bite out of his neck well it's I'm not sure if it's intended to actually be Anna or just some sort of like uh, succubi demon kind of thing in this torture chamber well, that right. uses and people's Anna, memories against them or something, you and, know. And Anna's not even a real character, a real person anyway, because we know right, that, right. that he's a he's a fictional character and she is a fictional character too. I would have rather see the Beast kill Christopher Lloyd's character. I think that would have been a yeah. more fitting end for the this guy because he created yeah. the Beast, right? He created Othakai. Yeah. So I think that would have given it a more uh, a better dimension of like, oh, uh, yeah. I'm going to kill my own creator. Like you said, it feels like it was a wasted death there. Yeah. And it would still give him the chance to be the hero, Rob, you know. He looks so good sitting in that throne. Yeah, and I I think it's really interesting here because I, I love how, how kind of bored he is with his life. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like, like Pinhead, you know. Like Pinhead, like Mamoulian from yeah. the Damnation game. He's like, yeah, sure, uh, go ahead and shoot me. I don't like care. Nyx. Yeah. 
And it's kind of like, well, yeah, now I guess we're going to have to, I'm going to have to fight you. I don't really care. I don't think you can beat me. Good detail, taking out the bullets out yeah. of the wounds. God, I wonder how long it took to put all that makeup on. Yeah. This is definitely one of one of his best monster roles. Yeah. I I, I think he's more interesting visually than than Candyman, to be honest. And that might sound a little, you know, over the top for some people. Like, oh, I love Candyman, but it's like, yeah, yeah but this monster man is so badass. That's true. Yeah, if you just break it down to that, I mean, as a you know, comparing the two movies, obviously Candyman is better. Hey, did you ever watch that show with Ron Perlman back in the eighties, Beauty and the Beast? Oh yeah, with Sarah Connor. <laughs> I used to, yeah, yeah, I used to love that show. Yeah, I used to love it. I mean, it's a little dated now because of all the, it, yeah, it's a little like too poetic sometimes. Uh, but it was Nightbreed before Nightbreed. Yeah, yeah. He had like the Morlocks or whatever they were called. We, I watched it. I York. watched it sometimes, but sometimes, you know, my parents were in charge of the remote control. So. Sure, sure. I was listening to a podcast the other day with Ron Perlman, where he said it was a great show. He loved doing it, and he got some good money enough to get himself in trouble <laughs> because <laughs> he bought a house and then he didn't work after the show for three years. So oh, jeez. Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes actors get typecast. Or a TV show is no guarantee that the career is going to soar after that, even if it's a really popular one, yeah. I guess. She's, she's the good one. Yeah. Because she loves him. run <laughs> that's a, that's a weird twist right yeah. like he he click cocks the gun as if he's pretending to shoot her taking her hostage and, well, uh, and he he does know that they're sort of in it in this together yeah that that uh that they work together to kill those uh, the three authors so but why does he it's it's weird This tunnel is almost like a mixture between Hellraiser and Nightbraid. Yeah. You got the chains hanging, and then you got the, the, the cave, underground cave kind of thing. Yeah. And they, they made it all the way up to the roof from the from the basement. Yeah. It's like, oh, Oops. no. You just killed her anyway. Go. <clears throat> At this point, I'm not sure if I was believing that this guy was actually a character. I was like, oh. Maybe maybe the monster and, and and Valerie were just the characters, and he was actually really a real guy. Yeah, I was thinking, why is he maybe lasting they're... so long compared to Valerie? Yeah, yeah, but then as it turns out, and we're going to see it here, it's a beautiful ending scene. I thought, really fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, and, and other it, people could see them too. Obviously, I mean. And at this point, you would expect like he would have the gun in his hand, and then the police would shoot him because he had a gun in his hand. But you know, it's kind of nice that that's not the way it ended. They're giving him a warning: drop the yeah. gun, son. Yeah, yeah. Police are actually not, you know, jump trigger happy, you know, jumpy. Because they could have shot him, and he would fall down and turn into pages as he falls down. That could have been like a, an ending as well, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, but he has to have this realization moment here at the end, and it yeah. works so well. Like this, this makeup, it really works. Yeah, I wonder how they did that. It's really cool. How they, how they managed to transfer that? Maybe they had some sort of like uh, plate where they would just press the hand, and it would just press onto his hand. And, and you're an actor. How do you uh, how do you how do you show everybody that you're learning for the first time that you're a fictional character? Right, right. It's, you have to really convey that. It's so it's so meta too, because I mean, he's an actor playing a fictional character who is a fictional character. Yeah, 
Special effects here are a little weird, but uh, I guess it's it's part oh, like, of the transformation. Like his, his jacket disappearing and stuff. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love this part here where he, you know, he's uh, he looks like a, a skeleton made out of book pages. Yeah, just fantastic. Mm-hmm. I love this ending scene. Mm-hmm. Just beautiful. I think I could have done without this last page flying into the camera, though. Oh yeah, it's a little kind of hammy, but you know. Uh, well, why not, you know? And the police are like, Rep- hey, there are all these pages, or why are these pages falling on my head? Pages and keep so falling on my head. That Rob Hennessy never became a published author. Like, yeah, no kidding. Yeah, I would have I would have given up on that last shot. Um, I think I would have been just happy to see him like turn into a bunch of pages, but uh, yeah. but really cool, really cool uh, story here. Yeah, following uh, on the stairs. There were just a few problems that may have been solved if they just had a little more time to to uh, flesh out the 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 story and like who knew what and and yeah. It's also a great art direction. A little bit confusing about is Valerie a good a good character or not? And I think that Patricia put a lot of her rage and anger into it, like she was saying. So that's yeah. probably why the the character was a little poisoned by it. Yeah. But you do get this relationship between Valerie and, and the Beast Othakai that uh, they were kind of in it together. They they kind of liked each other. Like yeah. she was kind of his slave, but she enjoyed it a little bit. Uh, when when he says no, she loves me. She's mine, you know. She kind of does a little bit. Yeah, it's this kind of weird Stockholm syndrome thing going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Great art direction here by Don McCulley. Um, Andre Adrianco was the assistant art director, and uh, well, and she's, I guess she, that's she, it. she was chained to him by like Job of the Hut, even though she really didn't need to be. So there's a lot of there's a lot of little elements of the story that are like this is this is the way we're written to be, but this is the way you know. But but the reality is the way the way we want to be is more like she she's in charge and she tells Othakai what to do. And... Mm-hmm. So you know, go go check out the Clyde Barker's 45 page treatment. It's at um, Revelations website, clydebarker.info slash ValerieTV.html. You'll be able to find all uh, sorts of things with the uh, people from Can Can Be Effects talking about this, and Clyde Barker talking about this. Christopher Lloyd, uh, Tony Todd said about Othakai. He said he's not abusive. First of all, he's in love with this woman. He's a romantic, tortured soul that could only that could apply to anybody. You may not get it until the end, but because I'm playing a t- uh, through line, every moment I have with Valerie is totally about love and obsession. Maybe an overwhelming obsession, too much love. I don't, I don't know how to do it right. Well, and uh, and Christopher Lloyd said, I feel there's a seriousness about it because the only way this particular script can work is if all the characters and the actors playing them take everything very seriously. These are people who create a reality that gets out of control. You have to play the honesty of that. It would be easy to do a send-up, but they're truly scared. This is a serious situation. There's a lot of stuff that you can read there, so uh, go check out ClydeBarker.info and uh, read the read the draft of the the treatment. It's pretty cool. Well, we did it, and I think our next um, next up, I think we'll be talking about the um, the Great Unknown, the the script for the 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 Harry Demore, the first Harry first adventure. Movie. Yeah. That never that never made it to, to screen. Yeah, so keep keep, keep uh, checking out our blog and website and Facebook page. And thanks for listening. And this was a, another stretch goal of Kickstarter uh, 2017 uh, Blood Money. So yeah. thanks to all our supporters and our our sponsors. You can find the show notes for this page and lots of Clive Barker news and features at www.clivebarkercast.com. Leave comments there or get them directly into the podcast by clicking the Send Voicemail tab on the right. Please follow us on Twitter at BarkerCast or at Occupy Midian. Like us on Facebook and join the Occupy Midian Facebook group. You can listen on the site or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Libsyn, TuneIn, PocketCast, Google Play, and DoubleTwist. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. 
Please take a couple of minutes to leave us a review on iTunes. It means the world to us and helps us spread the word about Clive Barker. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial fan site and podcast that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Films. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.